Welcome everybody to this week's edition of Water Talks. Uh, we're going to be talking about creating impactful change in your organization by implementing digital twin technology. And whether you've been here before or this is your first time, we always like to remind you that the goal is to create a community where you can come and ask uh, any and all of your questions. We'll provide answers, give advice, offer insights, feedback. We do like this to be an interactive session and especially today's version of Water Talk. We're really, really hoping to get some engagement from the from the crowd. Um, some additional notes, Water Talks will be every other week, still Tuesday at noon Eastern. We do have some exciting upcoming Water Talks where we're gonna be talking about expanding the value of your integrated catchment models with Optimizer, looking at Infoworks ICM, and on the 18th, understanding system curves and pumps to better understand your model. Um, and that's going to be on InfoWater Pro. And then the final little bit of housekeeping, you do have the Q&A button and the chat button at the bottom. We do ask that uh, for your questions and engagements that you use the Q&A section. Um, that's what we're going to be monitoring. Um, so we like to remind that. And then uh, the sessions will be recorded and usually they are allowed to be shared at the end. Um, so with all of that, housekeeping items done. Um, today's going to look a little different than a normal water talk. We're going to have more of a casual discussion around data culture and how to inspire change throughout outcomes and various tools. We'll talk about SWAN and AWWA digital twin definition and what this means for the, inter uh, for the industry. Um, so without further ado, let's hop right into it. My name is Hunter Sparks, and I'm a sales engineer at Autodesk on the Innovise team with a primary focus on our cloud and SaaS products. I worked seven and a half years in the civil engineering space between geotech and land development, and I've switched over to the software sales side uh, about two years ago. And I'm really excited for this water talk to be joined by Javier Cantu. Javier, would you like to do a quick introduction? Yeah, um, also really excited to be here. Um, you know, today's supposed to be somewhat a little bit different. We're gonna have a little bit more of a conversation and uh, pretty stoked about it. I'm Javier Cantu. Um, I'm the Digital Twin Solutions Architect. Um, I also sit as the uh, uh, subcommittee chair of the digital AWWA's Digital Twins uh, Terminology uh, Subcommittee. Um, I've been in the industry roughly 15 years now. I started utility, uh, did, uh, did engineering consulting for about 10 years, and now, now I'm here. And uh, basically, we've had a focus around the last three to four years on just uh, helping utilities or transforming different, different uh, doing digital transformation and implementing different types of digital technologies. No, that's great. And, and with with your background and experience, you know, one of the reasons uh, me personally, I'm excited to be doing this water talk with you, especially with it being a little bit of a different style. You and I have had a lot of conversations, uh, you know, off screen, off demos about this topic. So I'm just really excited to, to be doing this one with you. Um, and so just, just to jump right in, SWAN and AWWA define digital twin as a dynamic digital representation of real world entities and their behaviors using models with strict with static and dynamic data that enables insights and interactions to drive actionable and improved outcomes. You know, that's, as you can see, as I stumble over those words, it really is a mouthful. And Javi, you, you're on that council who helps come up with these definitions. Um, so really curious about why developing this digital twin definition was important, especially as we know, that's, uh, you know, everyone's favorite buzzword in the industry lately. Yeah, um, I mean, hopefully we'll, we'll move on from the topic <laughs> really quick because, you know, it is a little Digital twin, right? Um, I mean, it. I, I wish it could have been more succinct, right? It, it's my first answer, but it, uh, I, I, I believe there's some people on the call here that may have also been a part of that program or may have been on the SWAN side of things. Um, and it, it was a little bit controversial at first, right? Just wondering whether or not it was worth uh, starting a subcommittee for terms and terminology, right? Uh, but 
you know, there are a lot of ISO standards out there, or when you look at AWWA manuals of practice, right, that actually do uh, make it their job and, and their mission to make sure that there's some standard ter terminology out there. But it's pretty clear, you know, that uh, something like this was required. Um, I, I don't know if a lot of people on this call are aware, but there's, you know, like, uh, the Engineering Modeling Applications Community, which is uh, EMAC, you know, they, I believe EMAC is responsible for authoring uh, N32, which is a WWA's manual of water supply practices, you know, for hydraulic modeling. And there's also the Water Utility Technology and Automation Committee, which is like instrumentation and control, right? And they, uh, they, they, they typically write like M2, which is a manual practice there. So, they both kind of started coming up with their own definitions and stuff like that. And notice when they were doing QA, QC and cross-referencing, oh, well, there's some differences here. Uh, why don't we go out into industry and, and try to simplify this? And what came out of it was this, uh, this, this one particular de definition as, as you read, <laughs> and I will, will not prove uh, again. Um, but really it, it was important because um, it's a word that's commonly used, right? And I think what we were really trying to do is get pushed through the idea that the digital twin can hopefully be a, 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 a journey and something that's developed over time. Um, but overall, what we're trying to do uh, it, it was to find that term because it's critical um, to have that common knowledge and, and broad agreement, not just within the you know nonprofit organization world, but also the vendor world, and also you know the consulting world. Um, uh, it, along those lines, you know, you know, creating this this common language uh, it's really helped us increase efficiencies. You know, conserve resources. You know, internally at over at AWWA, and without it, we would just be chasing the same thing in different ways. Um, so uh, I'm really hoping and encouraging uh, the industry to uh, adopt this and, 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 it, and go over to the SWAN Forum website where you can find the Digital Twin Readiness Guide, uh, where you can find a lot more details and information around this. Um, it all ultimately helps push the industry towards that data culture, right? Which I think is what we're gonna be talking about here shortly. And I, I definitely want to touch on data culture more. We do have some some questions already coming in, two of which are surrounding uh, your your microphone. I don't know if it's a wrong input, but they're asking if they you can turn up the volume um, or move closer to the microphone. I don't know if it's an input issue. Yeah, let me uh, try this one. Is this... Uh... I'm hoping this is better, and I'm going to turn up my microphone a little bit as well. It definitely sounded louder to me. Perfect. Um, so, so we'll just we'll make sure that it translates to everyone else. See, that's why it's fun doing these things live, so you can pivot and uh, do all this exciting stuff. Um, yeah. and, and then we also have um, someone asking to, uh, and we did get a thumbs up from one of the people saying that it's better. So great job. We, we conquered that hurdle. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, really good question right off the back. Uh, what SWAN? Uh, so could you, could you give people a little bit of background on that? Yeah, no, SWAN is like the smart water. Well, it's a smart water networks forum. Um, it's a global organization, a nonprofit. Um, I believe they're uh, corporate office out of Israel. Uh, really, they've really centered around developing standards and uh, committee groups around the digital twin. Um, they held their last conference here in the United States uh, in Washington, D.C. earlier in May, I believe, Hunter. I think you were there with me. Um, and yeah, and as I mentioned, a lot of their a lot of their work is around digital transformation in the water industry and in for particular. So when you go to these conferences or when you go over to the website, what you find is a lot more information in regards to how to transform your organization, uh, what are the requirements for certain types of digital twins, what kind of outcomes can you achieve. Um, it's a very great resource because uh, uh, at that resource you can find uh, a lot of good justifications for uh, digital transformation as well and, uh, and standards for that matter. Um, 
I think our next hurdle over at Swan is kind of defining the common data environment and what's needed in the water industry around a CDE, uh, which is common data environment. Um, it, it's important because you know we have models, uh, building information models, and we also have operational models. We have simulation models, and all of those kind of export similar. Well, I guess you could, you could say XML documents or CSV data sets uh, or some sort of time series data or, well, not maybe not for, for building information models, but all of these data sets uh, overall, we're, we're heading towards, I guess, an industry that's looking to consolidate all of those things into one common information model. Uh, this is going to make it a lot easier to call on whatever data may be needed for calibrations or operational analyses, uh, simulations for design, and so on and so forth. Um, so very, very cool work going on at SWAN right now, uh, looking into standardizing around that CD. Definitely recommend checking out. I believe it's SWAN, S-W-A-N-Forum.com is their website. And the, one reason I love doing these water talks is we do have so many people that are locked in and knowledgeable uh, in the chat asking questions. Uh, so we're told <laughs> Swan Forum is located in UK, in the UK. Okay, and, there you uh, go. It's swan-forum.com. So ah, there perfect. you know, see, see, see can, really Javi was just testing everyone by uh, being yeah. purposely off just a little bit, make sure everyone's had their morning coffee and everyone's, everyone's awake. So thank you. Thank you for that information, Javi, and for the experts yeah. in the chat, keeping us, keeping us on track. Thank you. And um, so one of the topics and words that you brought up before we went into the Q&A session was data culture. Um, that sounds like another, um, you know, hot button issue, hot take issue, um, and just kind of, you know, a lot of people know what an office culture can be. They know what a lot of the, you know, the culture for different aspects can be. And what do you make uh, data culture? Do you have any opinions on that? Um, well, I'm definitely curious to see what comes out in the chat here, and I want to pick up a little bit of what we uh, get on the chat. So if anybody's got any, uh, well, hot takes, right, go ahead and uh, drop them in. But, you know, culture to me, because, uh, you know, I'll answer this, is it's a very personal, right, it has to do with values, um, and we all have different values. However, my hope, at least, uh, with, uh, you know, data culture and, you know, uh, professional industry is that when it comes to this work that, uh, that people, well, people also go to work that aligns someone that has at least enough values, right, that aligns with that organization. Um, and what, I mean, I, I know here at Autodesk, like, we are very driven uh, through our values and how we do our work, right? Um, and in order to have success in building some of that data culture, we have to have access to that data and recognize that data culture is a decision culture, right? Um, data culture is not about like, oh, how much can I collect? How much can I do, right? It's more so... Uh, what do we need to make the best decision so that we're not just going off like, you know, opinions and hunches of one another. And of course we all work together to collect the right amount of data. Um, can't really approach data analysis as a cool science experiment, right? Uh, the fundamental objective in collecting, analyzing, deploying data is to make better decisions. Um, it, I mean, I, I want to, I guess, kick off this uh, conversation on data culture a little bit uh, by uh, discussing kind of like our old school days, right? Do you remember our, our or the, or even what, how we started? Do you remember our EIT days where a majority of our job was data collection? Oh, 100%. 100% coming from the uh, geotech and construction materials testing background. A lot of my beginning jobs uh, were going out on construction sites, you know, monitoring constructions, making sure that the width of a trench was the proper, you know, the proper width. They're collecting soil borings. And, um, you know, they, a lot of people joke that they're called boring logs for many reasons. Uh, just collecting that data, looking at the split spoons. So uh, in the beginning, um, that is 
is a lot of how we get started. Even when I switched over to land development, I remember my first job, which is kind of a little bit maybe a different way of looking at data, it was updating people's CAD standards. So taking their old drawings that were in their previous CAD standards, and we were picking up the project that got shelved um, you know, for the, in the 2008 time where a lot of projects were being shelved. And during that time, they came up with a new, um, new set of standards for their CAD drawings. So my first job was taking those projects mm-hmm. and updating them. Yeah. Wow. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I, fortunately I didn't have to deal with boring logs, right. But, um, uh, but they're yeah, a little I bit mean, more exciting than the name sounds. I will give okay. them credit. a little bit more exciting. <laughs> yeah. I do. I do recall like a uh, first year though, uh, at, at black and beach. I remember one of my first projects was, Hey, go consolidate O and M manuals and the operator logs. Right. Uh, at a plant and oh my gosh, binders and binders and binders and binders. And a lot of it was digitization. And then it, I think of times at a utility where it was like at sitting there watching a CCTV video, right? Uh, just hours of dirty videos, right? And all the jokes associated with, uh, with I spent my day watching dirty videos, right? <laughs> um, which was ridiculous, but yes, um, I'm sure a lot of us have very many similar experiences um, and we're aware that, you know, these are still tasks that can bog us down today, not just our organizations, but maybe uh, in our daily lives. But, you know, things have changed and things continue to change. Uh, I mean, I didn't think back in 2006 that I would be asking Google to turn on my lights and turn off my lights. Right. Um, and. Uh, but that comes back to like how we were trained to do a lot of the things that we did in school as well, right? Um, I feel like now a majority of my job, even though you know I helped in digital transformation and stuff, even right before I went into software, uh, was data science, um, being a workflow integrator, right? A delivery manager uh, and very, very the amount of calculus that i do has decreased tremendously right um so i guess the job functions that we are expected to do nowadays is a little bit different as well too right um i mean i did a quick search right before this talk because i wanted to have a rough estimate right on linkedin there are sixteen thousand water treatment jobs just based off that water treatment jobs available today like on linkedin right uh, and I, every time I talk to a new customer, I still hear, wow, uh, we can't find people like, and our most knowledgeable people are retiring, right? You still hear that all the time. Right. Um, and I have a lot of friends and I volunteer at the local college as well. Not, I think I know two people in the graduating class are going into the water industry too. So wow. that to me is also like. I, I look at it and I'm just like, hey, all right, how do we, how do we get a lot large part of the, that group into our industry, right? Um, and you know, increase the amount of workforce into that pipeline that we have because I know that we have a lot of work and I know that there's even more work coming. I don't think I ever stop hearing that. Um, so I guess you know the journey of a digital twin is really part of that data culture that helped change the way we work right in the water industry and uh but yeah i mean i'm curious hunter like what kind of how how did you go to school out of curiosity can you tell me a little bit about the framework of of your degree did did you specifically study geotechnical engineering or or what so got there eventually um, you know, it, it's yeah. always interesting hearing how people got into the water industry, just because looking at uh, my background in the schooling, you might not not have guessed how uh, how I ended up here. But uh, I went to Virginia Tech and knew that I wanted to go into some form of engineering. So I started just in uh, general, didn't, you know, knocking out a lot of my maths, my sciences, the electives. Um, and then um, after looking at the different engineering landed on civil, um, I think part of it was uh, I used AutoCAD in um, in high school a little bit, and then uh, 
So that's really where I was taking two years of core engineering classes and really um, started to enjoy the transportation and, and soil side of things. Um, once we started, how it works is you take general classes, then you choose a couple that you want to within your certain type of engineering degree to concentrate on. And so I you know, started to specialize in courses in transportation, construction, management, civil, and uh, geotech. Um, and then eventually got to the end and uh, ended up choosing geotech because it seemed like a lot of active being outside. Um, really enjoyed that until I realized, oh, wait, I have to be tied to a construction schedule. So that was uh, that was a little bit of a wake up call after uh, after college going to those construction sites at three o'clock in the morning. But that's that's kind of how I landed on the on the geotech side of things. And then after doing that for three years, uh, switched into the land development world. That's awesome. Uh, it sounds very familiar to, you know, I guess my civil civil degree, right? You know, core classes and, uh, you know, then you go into those specializations. But I, I'm curious, did you ever, because I know you're, you're considered a, a, a very power user of our ICM and, uh, and, and our info drainage solutions. Did you ever take an advanced modeling course in, in school? I did not. What about like advanced statistics and stuff like that for like, I guess, solution mapping? Nope. Uh, what about for the scripts that you write on top of ICN? Did you do computer programming, right? I think I had one basic class that I was that I was required to take. And that's about it. Wow. Um, well, I see. And I know at least from the consultants I talked to, the people with those skill sets end up doing a lot of that design work right or a lot of decisions are end up being made from that from the simulations and design work and you know the data analysis uh associated with with you know specific site right because we're having we're we get to design now to a very specific environment uh but i i asked those th things because i didn't take those classes either right but um you know as a designer uh, myself or, you know, probably you and many others out there find themselves developing tools, right, to help perform whatever tasks you got to do uh, or calculations you got to do faster. Uh, and I suspect that the way that we train uh, future engineers, uh, it's going to change as well. Uh, I mean, the, I, I can't imagine uh, the civil engineer program looking the way it does traditionally. Uh, five, 10 years from now, um, do you feel it would stay the same? I mean, now that you've made the point uh, that it'll probably change, and I suppose that it will change on how we're onboarding, uh, how it will take place at companies and utilities, how a lot of people will start solving the issues uh, seems a bit overwhelming and a probable culture shock, putting software engineers with field engineers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, do you think architects and engineers have differences? <laughs> that's, that's, that, that's a whole different ball game. Um, but you know, uh, every customer, uh, I mean, you're very customer facing in your job, and and uh, I'm sure a lot of people here can speak a lot on the struggle of you know any sort of culture change or or anything of the sort. But it's happening whether we like it or not, right? Uh, a lot of the EITs we we come in come in with different skill sets, different ways uh, to look at things, um, and um, but yeah, I, I think it's just kind of um, kind of something that we kind of need to prepare for, right? Because that that change is coming. And do you think? Uh, you know, going through the COVID pandemic, people having to work from home, changing how uh, their work looks uh, has accelerated data culture adoption? Uh, without a doubt. Um, I mean, things have more or less cooled down. I think I read this to president, like uh, officially called it over or something like that. Uh, but um, interest in our purchase, I, at least I can speak to us, right? Uh, I know that in since about May of this year, interest on and purchases of our cloud platform and our digital transformation tools 
has gone up, right? I do hypothesize that this is because um, it has a lot to do with having to get more work done with less employees, uh, helping in these organizations, whether it be the consulting reach, uh, reaching out to us or uh, utilities, uh, trying to automate workflows uh, to help pre prepare for other future disruptions that might happen, right? No, completely agree. And I know we're about to hop into a poll, but we do have um, a question that I think kind of can fit in right before we hop into this poll is, uh, what do you mean by data analytics? Is it beyond analysis? If yes, what else would you include? Mm, beyond analysis. Yeah, um, so data analytics, it that doesn't necessarily include uh, simulation, right, uh, which can be very numerical, um, ODEs or ordinary differential equations. Um, that comes, uh, you know, that spits out, that's straight physics, it spits out, hey, based off this known, uh, this known component, this is what we expect things to happen. This is how a lot of proofs, mathematic proofs have written. So in that re in that regard, it, it's more proof or theoretical proof than it would be, you know, just look at statistics, which is, uh, I would I would put the data science and data analytics uh, uh, science under, for sure. No, that's, that's great insight. Um, and, and I know we've, we've you know, laid the baseline work and a little bit of background of what we're going to talk today. So um, let's, let's get into the meat of the conversation and talk about some of the challenges uh, we face in driving the adoption of data culture. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull up a poll for the audience. So if you guys can uh, take a moment and respond to the poll. And I believe it just launched. We'll see hopefully some participants hopping in. Um, and what we're asking is, what is the biggest challenge you face in driving adoption of a data culture? All right, we have some people willing to participate today. I love when that happens. And we'll give just a little bit more time, get some of these answers coming in. All right, we'll give it one more final chance for your voice to be heard. I'm going to go ahead and end that poll and go ahead and share the results. So that should be up on the screen. And uh, Javi, I don't, I don't know if you want to uh, talk to any of these results and, um, you know, maybe how you can respond or overcome some of these challenges. I mean, it looks like, you know, we've got 51% and a pretty high participation rate uh, saying that the lack of resources, time, money, staff. Wow. Um... Yeah, I'm actually very surprised overall, like uh, data and cloud security is 7%, right? Yeah. Um, but um, which goes to show, uh, because I, th I think between like 2022 and 2012, like data and cloud security, I think 2012, like an AWDLA industry segment was like data and cloud security was at the top, or yeah. it was like the number two biggest challenge, right, in, in our existing implementing new technologies. And then this past year, like went down to like six, but yeah. Um, so, I mean, lack of resources, time and money, right? Um, so, I mean, that's, uh, I, I, there's, that's very understandable. I spoke to it earlier, right? There, there's, a, there's a lot less, there's a lot more things to do today than there are uh, or there are a lot more things to do today than there are more staff to help us do it, right? Um, but at the same time, you know, I think that that is the justification. That is the reason for something like digital twin, because digital twins and common data environments as a whole uh, can be leveraged to do more work uh, at less cost. So ROIs are 
can be calculated. And when you do a business case uh, for utility, which sometimes we do get asked to help develop for an organization, um, you'd find that it's usually easier to, uh, well, business case as in, do we build or do we buy our, our digital twin platform or our, or our common data environment space, right? Some organizations will choose and they will go and build around their, you know, Office 365 Power BI, right? Which is a great way to start, right? In some cases, you'll find your utilities already have access to that information or access to that software. Uh, and it's not a big heavy lift. It's a matter of just getting the right network infrastructure to develop a common data environment in order to start building up a digital twin. That's just one way to get started when, when you're kind of like low on money. Uh, when it comes to time or staff or anything like that, uh, you know, I, as I mentioned, I do think it's important to make time in the budget. But uh, luckily, there are you know consultants out there uh, and solution vendors like us with uh, SaaS products that actually start at a very very low tier that allow you to expand slowly. Um, it is a journey, uh, and it's definitely not going to be easy, but there are various solutions. We can definitely speak to some of them here in a little bit. Uh, so you can start at a low tier and expand later or, or, you know, otherwise I definitely recommend some of our, some of our, um, partners start at the power BI level, right? Um, I'm seeing the second most one was kind of resistance to change. This is how we've always done it. Uh, then that is a very awkward phrase for any professional. Uh, I can suggest at least, uh, I don't know. Well, Hunter, what do you, what do you, what, how, how do you normally respond to this when, when you, when you, uh, when you hear this uh, in the field? Yeah. Well, when I was in the, in the field and, and trying to, move, you know, more advanced technologies. It was really um, trying to find uh, that that why, um, why the move to a more digital uh, transformation is more efficient, try and time it back to how much time you can save, really pointing out, um, you know, trying to have an example of maybe not a full project or a part of the design that you can show in a more digital forward way and talk about the efficiencies of, hey, I've, you know, you've seen me do it in these previous methods, but by uh, by moving to a more more advanced uh, technological solution, um, the time savings, I think that's something that's always going to always going to uh track with people no i agree um i mean I, I don't think i could have said better myself you know who what when where and why right that's it you can if you can answer those questions which you know i guess got drilled down to me uh on my by by a lot of my managers um that that is the first step to making that business case and it, it's really difficult like once you've got the right data and you've ran the right discovery around that solution, right? Uh, that's to, to say no, right? Uh, that ultimately uh, we want to keep up with the industry, right? So we so someone at, at the end of the day needs to kind of take up that that responsibility in developing that type of this business case for 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 change, right? Or change management. Um, which I guess is the, the last item here, but we've only got eight, eight votes on this one uh, on training and change management. Uh, but um, and I know, I know when I when I look to train on a new platform or anything like that, and when I'm talking, you know, that it's very hard for me to get like operators or you know engineering managers or something like that all in on a room because you know there's more important things going on, like you know bursting pipe or you know. Uh, you know, HeadWorks facility is blinded or something like that. Uh, or I, I just so happen to always have training when budget is due. Uh, uh, it, but in that particular case, I'd say, you know, it, it it's okay to pressure us, you know, like, like people that make products, uh, pressure the industry a little bit to build more intuitive products, right? Um Yes, we want to still make sure that we provide their adequate training and we have those resources available. But at the same time, if a product requires 
you know, four or five days worth of training to use effectively. And I, I would, I, I would definitely say uh, those changes need to happen there in the product side as well, right? Uh, you know, you know, the Apple or or the Google phones or uh, the technologies that we use every day, the, those weren't uh, widely adopted because they're complicated to use, right? The, they're widely adopted because they're easy to use. So, it, you know, feedback is welcome. And uh, at, at least you're at Autodesk and any time that, that uh, if you have any sort of feedback, how we could improve user experience, happy to take it uh, as it's going to help us improve and, and and make that data culture change in, in, in the future. And I actually really like uh, a question that just came in. Um, and I, I definitely like to get your, your thoughts on this. Um, someone asked, do you think data management adoption is more effective as a top down or bottom up approach? Oh man. I think that's a really good question for this conversation. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, it depends, you know, uh, I've worked with utilities or like private water, uh, uh, suppliers that run on a five to 10 person shop. Right. In which case bottom, bottom up, uh, in the end, uh, I don't know, if this is going to answer the question, but knowing where you want to be, like knowing the outcome that you want to achieve from the data. Like I want to reduce cost, or I want to reduce the time it takes me to uh, to fix a piece of equipment. Knowing that specific outcome or KPI or key performance indicator is what comes first, right? Um, whether or not that change is inspired from you know grassroots, from the bottom of organization up, or down to bottom, I think it's very dependent on the size of the organization. I think. Uh, Large organizations usually uh, can only be effective if they have an executive sponsor. So they've got to have somebody at the very top. Uh, smaller organizations, you can you find that it's relatively, uh, especially if they're under under 50 people, it's relatively simple to start bottom, go up. Um, and, you know, got the medium sized organizations where I definitely see like uh, we have to approach various department managers, right? Before before the ex like executive sponsor or director level is looking at it, right? But um, it can vary um, and it, you have different challenges with each type of organization. But uh, what do you think, Hunter? Like, uh, you know, the bottom up, top down approach, uh, you know, uh, uh, do you use these? I think I think how you phrased it is, you know, it, it's there's not unfortunately a, a blanket answer for, um, you know, which one is best. It does depend on the organization. The only thing I would add is, um, from what I've seen, a lot of times this adoption is the most effective, whether it's top down or bottom up, is having someone that uh, wants to make the change, wants to spearhead that effort. Um, it, you know, trying to affect data management adoption it isn't something that um, from what I've seen is successful if someone is um, you know if there isn't a main person trying to drive that change um, is at least at least what I've what I've seen in my experience yeah and um, well I guess when you're trying to drop because I, I mean you're in sales now so you're very your front lines uh, in, in this organization this is why I come and talk to you quite a lot right because you you hear uh, the the blockers or uh, first uh, but I, I'm curious in your experience um, what's the quickest way I guess to uh, kind of adopt that kind of digital twin you know ultimately? Uh, that I don't know if you have a specific example or anything like that that you can point to. And I think you might have uh, might have dropped the breadcrumbs a little bit in uh, in answering one of the ones above. But um, most of the time, you have to start with that desired outcome, 
you know, the outcome framework uh, connects our solutions to capabilities, workflows, products, audiences, you know, really everything. It's, you know, trying to, to get that who, what, when, where, why, you know, marching down the line. Um, you know, in some examples, uh, of course, with it being water talk, going to use our current examples and current solutions, um, you know, for example, uh, Info360 Asset, you know, it really does help with that, you know, simplified CCTV vendor and workflows. So making sure that stream of information is as efficient as possible. Uh, having that, you know, being on the cloud, having that unlimited video and image storage, I think is huge as um, that, you know, utilities have been collecting that for years and years and years. So even if they've digitized it, saving it on a, on a server can take up, you know, terabytes of information. Um, trying to have as, you know, automated as possible for that consequence of failure calculations, you know, really reducing that time it takes to, to batch run those. And of course, having an interactive map that people that can jump into, pull out the information that they uh, feel is important, um, maybe for someone across different levels of the organization, not necessarily having to have that technical background, but maybe they just need a map that they can go into and look at their um, high risk pipes. So I think all of those um, outcomes are, are, you know, attributed to to that solution and kind of answer those questions. Uh, and I know one of your expertises, uh, we're about to release Info360 Plant. Um, and, you know, could you tell us some of the outcomes with that? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's true. We have something up here on the street, uh, uh, on the on the slides. Uh, but yeah, so I guess Info360 Plant kind of dear to me because you know I, I come from a plant background and uh, it's uh, something I've been working on for the last for the last year here with with a really awesome team uh, but really I know it focuses around vertical assets right uh, and essentially treatment plants you know uh, chemical stations uh, well sites uh, whether it be water wastewater any sort type of facility that you can find but um I guess when it comes to the outcomes that are achieved in that in that space, you know, we can we find tools around uh, managing cost management and reducing costs for process areas like uh, you know energy usage uh, in a narration tank, uh, chemical waste uh, or excess chemical dosing at specific process areas. Uh, so we've got reduction of costs. Uh, Definitely reducing of time when it comes to reporting or generating kind of like a, a, a CIP plan or even just like a compliance report like for to be sent out uh, to to you know your local environmental protection agency like your state agency. Um, so I, I at least I remember from uh, I was at an industrial facility where I did a, a month long rotational program. Uh, at, well, I did a month long rotational program at, at a power generation facility and we had a NPDS permit, right? Uh, about a week's time I had to spend to collect the data, the permit data uh, around, right? To, uh, to be able to fill out and deliver all the adequate reporting to the state, right? Uh, so one quarter of my whole rotation experience was on data collection again, right? So plant, you know, uh, we're trying to make that, you know, a two minute task, right? Everything's in there. Everything's ready. You select the format. It's in and out, right? Uh, you know, diagno diagnostics of process controls, right? That's a, that's a good, clear outcome from plant. You can diagnose uh, plant upsets. They even start building forecasts out so you can understand what's coming in the future. Uh, you can imprint standard operating procedures, right? That constantly being updated so that you can onboard people, right? So in that case, the achieved outcome is something like make uh, uh, make onboarding new operators and, and maintenance personnel uh, a lot easier and a lot stickier, right? So it's easier to learn the plant operations. And of course, increasing sensor and data integrity uh, to to prepare for for further advances in the digital twin, right? Um, but that's a little bit of what that does. Um, I, I think some of those are uh, outcomes are shared with Info360 Insight, but I think you can give share share some light 
on some of the outcomes that that, that are available on Insight. Yeah, definitely. You know, with Info360 Plant really focusing on that treatment facilities, um, Info360 Insight moves more into the water distribution and collection systems, uh, trying to pull out those KPIs. Uh, I think one of the the really big ones that we pull out of there is uh, the non-revenue water and infrastructure leakage index, um, trying to quantify those using the data that people already have available. Um, I'm someone that lives uh, in in the Southwest now, um, you know, where where water is becoming more and more scarce. Um, you know, when when I was living back on uh, on the East Coast, uh, it wasn't something that I really thought about quite as much. But now, um, you know, living in Colorado, we need these systems to be as efficient as possible, getting that distribu- the water uh, to the customers that it needs to. So trying to reduce that non-revenue water and infrastructure leakage index can be, can be really important. Um, it's also, uh, you can also run uh, simulations to see customers that would be impacted were a pipe were, if a pipe were to burst. Um, and then as well as really having that um, connection between your live SCADA data and your hydraulic model and being able to push information back and forth in the most efficient way possible, really trying to aid in that model calibration using that live data. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And before we hop into the hop into the next part, I actually uh, someone uh, chimed in on our discussion about uh, the the top down and bottom up, and I think this is a great one uh, for organizational alignment. The approach should be both top down and there bottom up. There you go. Up. That, I think that's, that is, that's great. I think that's a great answer right there. Definitely, I'm going to be stealing that. Uh, whoever that came from, I appreciate that. Um, no, yeah. Um, we definitely have uh, tons of great capabilities, right? Uh, and, and every every two weeks, right? Because we're we you know we're Info three hundred and sixty now, and uh, Info three hundred and sixty allows us to push updates very very constantly. And hopefully, in the, in the future water talks, what we can do is um, kind of uh, show some of the updates from Info three hundred and sixty, right? But uh, I know we have a lot of great capabilities that can help us achieve great outcomes in those three different areas, whether it be asset, plant, or insight. Uh, but uh, you know, ultimately, driving that change towards that digital twin is about that journey that I keep talking about. Um, I know I'm, I'm sharing here uh, just a little bit of that process uh, shared on the G- digital twin readiness guide by Swan. Uh, you know, it's identifying the outcomes of what you want to do, you know, assessing, reviewing your key questions, evaluating existing infrastructure. Do you have the data to start building on that outcome? You know, implementing that, uh, that approach based off the data and then cont- continuing maintenance and, uh, and expanding the capabilities on those outcomes. There's a lot of more detail on how to go through that process and some of the requirements around that process uh, on the Swan Swan Forum website that I definitely uh, uh, encourage everyone to check out. Yeah, and, and you know we've kind of we've we've walked through um, a little bit about digital twin data culture, some of the challenges for overcoming, um, why we feel it's important. Um, and you know this is this is something that can seem like you you need to make huge monumental changes at what time to accomplish this, um, but I feel like that might actually be a, a misnomer, uh, you know, of of having to make those big changes. So, kind of curious about what little steps would you suge- suggest, and uh, what tools do we have here at Autodesk to drive that change? Um, I, I think there's a lot of already good documentation, whether it be the latest AWWA journal or the SWAN forum website on possible outcomes from digital twin, right? I think you can start there, pick up something uh, or, or pick pick something, right? Um, and then on our, on our end, you know, whether it be, you know, Insight, Asset, Plant, you know, Tandem, Forge, uh, Autodesk Construction Cloud, uh, you know, Autodesk has tons of solutions in the AUC industry, right? The architecture, engineering, construction industry, all of them cloud-based, all of them working to talk to one another on the on a common data environment, right? All these options come at different price points for all types of person. They're built for different personas, for different outcomes. And as we just 
well, as we just described, and they are, you know, available at different budget ranges as well. Some of them are really, really low for, for, for uh, starting a project on. Uh, these are available to help our customers, right? Choose what stage of a project and for what outcome they want to start their digital twin journey on. Uh, and maintaining that just kind of helps build and expand on it, you know, right? Some of some of our platform tools aren't a consumption model, right? So, you know, if you're only using so much or if you only have so much data, then you only pay so much, right? Uh, they So I think internally we have a lot of different ways that we can start that journey uh, within the same platform, right? Uh, to to eventually expand into a, an overall, you know, one water cycle solution, right? Uh, which is something like Info360 can provide, right? On the design stage, all the way through construction, um, we, we we have some tools and and products that can help in all those stages. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and that, I think, was the end of what we had planned to talk about today. Uh, we've got eight more minutes, so feel free to um, put questions in the Q&A dialog box, and we'd be more than happy to, to answer them. And I do think you achieved your goal of having the least amount of slides on a water talk in history. I'm not positive. I'll have to go back and check the records, but it's got to be up there. Mm, that's good. Now, uh, that that's what I was trying to do. Um, and, and I mean, next time we can, you know, even less slides, right? Why not? Why not run it on on our platform, right? Uh, run a water talks off various solutions and how to how to do several things, right? We can do outcomes. I, I'll also open the ideas here. I know we've, we're going to be here for a couple more minutes. Uh, if there are specific topics or things that you want to see, like definitely let us know. We'd be happy to uh, to 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 put that together to to discuss here at these water talks. <laughs> Just keep this open for another minute or two. And if not, we'll give people, you know, five minutes, five minutes back in your day. Um, okay. if, you, if you do, uh, I'll just I'll just plug something. I am here in Keystone at the Rocky Mountain Water Conference. Um, so if you're around, come by booth uh, 107 and uh, and say, hey. Yeah, I mean, that actually, that's announcements, right? Uh, Info 360 plant, right? It's coming. Uh, I'm really, really excited. Um, should be available in October. Come visit us at WefTech. We'll have a huge uh, product uh, product overview there, product kind of release, uh, I think, event happening over at our booth. So happy to happy to share more information there with people. You'll be at WefTech, right, Hunter? I will not be this year, unfortunately. Oh, unfortunately, okay. I'm not making the trip. Okay. Yeah, it was a lot of fun with you last last year. Had a good time. That was that was a that was a fun one, even with it being the the first one, first one kind of back. But that was <laughs> that that was that was a really good time. Web Tech's a really really good show. So a lot of we'll have a lot of good people there having uh, having conversations, ready to talk about everything going on at uh, at Autodesk on the Innovise team. I didn't plan this, but like I've got like my Cafe Dumont like mug right. Uh, which is New Orleans over at WebTech. So I'm, I'm, ex I'm excited doing, for the bananas. There you go. Just doing yeah. some special special marketing for them. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Well, um, we'll go ahead and uh, end that here. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you for the engagement on the polls and those questions. And Javier, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Hunter. Take care, everybody.